This is going to be an overview of the book of 2 Kings. And this book has 719 verses and 23,532 words, if you're interested in that. And the first part of the book focuses on Elijah's 66-year ministry. In chapters 1 and 2, you will see the end of Elijah's ministry. You have Elijah and Elisha. And Elijah passes everything down to Elijah. So you read heavily about Elijah from chapters 2 to 13. Then in chapters 12 to 17, you read about the fall of Israel. And 18 to 25, we'll focus on the fall of Judah. And in chapter 1, you have King Ahaziah, which is Ahab's son, who falls and gets sick. And being a wicked, wicked man, he seeks counsel from Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, instead of from the true god of the Bible. Just like many people do today, seeking counsel from something other than God. In 2 Kings 1, 2 through 4, it says, And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. So, you see here, Ahaziah, it doesn't have enough sense to call on the true God of the Bible. He wants to inquire of this Beelzebub, the God of Ekron. And God sends Elijah to preach against this false god. But how many times do you seek counsel from something other than God? How many times do you seek counsel from Google instead of the Bible? What if every time you needed an answer, you went to the Bible? Or at least if you're going to go to Google, look up the Bible answer on Google. Because, I mean, you can find a lot of King James Bible stuff just by typing in the question. And like many times, if... If I want to study on a certain topic, I'll just go to Google and type in the topic and hit King James Bible Study or something like that. You can use technology for the good, but most people are using it and having nothing to do with God. And many Christians today seek counsel from their false God instead of the God of the Bible. Elijah preaches against the false gods of Ekron. Beelzebub. And of course the king gets mad and wants to capture Elijah. Many times today people will get mad at the preacher and they may not try to kill the preacher or capture him like was happening with Elijah here, but they will try to catch him in his words. And Paul said, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? But you know the story about Elijah calling down fire from heaven like he'll also do in the tribulation, fire will proceed out of his mouth and devour his enemies. But in 2 Kings 1, 9 through 12, it says, Then the king said unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty. And he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of an hill, and he spake unto him, Thou men of God, the king hath said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again also he went, he sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. So God gave Elijah power with fire. And God takes care of those who are preaching his word. If God be for us, then who can be against us? And in chapter 2, you have Elijah being caught up to heaven. Elisha had been following Elijah, learning all that he could from him. And this is what a younger saint should do. Just like all the the people I usually hang, hang out with, that I try to hang out with as older Christians. 
And all the preachers I listen to are usually 60 plus, over 60, you know. They just, they have more wisdom. They've been at it longer. I like to plug into older Christians and just soak up all that they know. And this is the pattern of how you learn. In 2 Kings 2, 6 through 8, it says, And Elijah said unto him, or Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they two went on. So Elijah will not leave Elijah. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too st stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. So this is a great miracle. Just like Moses used his rod to part the waters, Elijah uses his mantle to part the waters. The Lord was behind both cases, of course. But this goes to show you that average men can have supernatural powers as long as God is on their side. Now, 2 Kings 2, 9 and 10 and 11 and 12. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elijah, Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless... If thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and Elijah saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. So Elisha saw Elijah go up. So you know what this means? This means Elijah gets a double portion of what Elijah had. So this means Elijah will do double the miracles as Elijah. So just as Elijah parted the waters, Elijah does the same exact thing with his mantle just a few verses later in second kings two fourteen, it says and he took the mantle of elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said where is the lord god of elijah and when he had also smitten the waters they parted hither and thither and elijah went over now elijah starts doing miracles right away he heals the spring of jericho in verse 21 and curses some enemies at the end of chapter 2 and the lord has two she bears come and tear them and you can tell right away this guy, Elijah, isn't someone to mess with. He has God's purpose on him. Uh, and he can't die or be brought down until God is through with him. But Elijah, the one that just went up in the chariot of fire, he did eight miracles. And Elijah's main, most outstanding miracles, there's eight of them. And one of them is shutting up heaven. First Kings 17, 1 Kings 17.1, so that it wouldn't rain. And in 17.14, he multiplied the oil. In 17.22, he raised the widow's son from the dead. 18.38, he called down fire from heaven. 18.45, he got the rain back. Second Kings 1.10, he called down fire from heaven. And 2.8, you have the parting of Jordan. First uh, Kings 1, or verse 12, in, or Second Kings 1, 12, he called down fire on 50. So there you have eight main miracles by Elijah. Shutting of heaven, multiplying the oil, widow's son raised, calling down fire from heaven, brought rain, then fire on the 50, and then fire on the 50 again, and then the parting of Jordan. And then you have Elisha, who gets a double portion, does 16 major miracles. In 2.14, he you saw him just now part Jordan, just like Elijah did. In 2.21, he heals the waters. In 2.24, he curses the the children and the two she-bears come down. In 320, you got water for kings. 
chapter 4, 1 through 6, you got oil for the widow. 4, 16 through 17, gift of the son. 4, 35, you have raising from the dead. 4, 41, you have healing of the pottage. 4, 43, you have bread multiplied. 5, 10, you have name and healed. 5, 27, you have Gehazi smitten. Chapter 6 and verse 6, he caused the iron to swim. 6.17, he gave sight to the blind. 6.18, smiting someone with blindness. 6.20, restoring the sight. And 13.21, one miracle you have after his death. And that's probably one of his greatest, the greatest miracle. So in chapter 3, you see that the miracles Elijah did to get water. In 2 Kings three fifteen through 17, it says, But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass, when the minstrel played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, You shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. Now notice that Elijah used music. Right before he preached, the minstrel played, and the hand of the Lord came upon him. So good godly music can help get you going. In Ephesians 5:19, it says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3:16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And music that gets me feeling the most excited or just closer to God is music with a lot of doctrine in it. There's a lot of songs where it's just like trying to play with your emotions, kind of like those songs on the, on the Starving Children commercials or something. But there's a lot of good songs with a lot of Bible doctrine in them. And those are my favorite, and that's what helps me the most. But notice that Elisha used that music to his advantage. And in 2 Kings 4, Elisha helps the Shunammite woman who is about to have her children taken by creditors for bondmen. And he miraculously gives her oil to sell. So he ends up saving her child's life, the same child that he prophesied that she would have. In 2 Kings 4, 34 through 40, uh, 35, it says, And he went up and lay upon the child, and put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro, and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. So you see where he, the same child here that he prophesied would be born, he ends up performing a miracle and saving his life. Then in chapter 5, you have this guy named Naaman, and he is a leper. In 2 Kings 5, 1, it says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. So notice that phrase, but he was a leper. There are great men, rich men, wise men, strong men, but they're all sinners. You may be pretty great in this world, but you're still a sinner. That's what that reminds you. Elijah performs a miracle concerning Naaman's leprosy. 2 Kings 5.10, And Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. And then in verse 14, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the men of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So notice that Naaman had his problem solved when he finally listened to the Lord through Elijah. And we should always look to seek counsel from the Lord, whether it be through his word or from a man proclaiming his word. When Naaman chose to obey the man proclaiming the word of God, he finally got healed. 
Naaman went to the preacher and found out how to get clean. Just like most of you found out how to get your sins washed in the blood when a preacher preached about it. Some preacher gave you the gospel and told you that you need to believe on Jesus Christ as a crucified, buried, and risen Savior. And then some, some man told you how to get clean after you were saved. Clean up your life. That's what you do after you get saved. You don't clean up your life to get saved. You get saved and then you let the Lord help you clean up your life. And in chapter 6 you have a cool story where Elisha reveals the spirit world to his servant. In 2 Kings six fifteen through 17 it says, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. What a great verse. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, Behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire, round about Elijah. So you see how great of a preacher Elisha is. And you can uh, do this same thing. Get people to realize that those that be with us are more than be with the enemy. Even when it seems like you are outnumbered, they that be with us are more than that be with them. Not only is the Lord a man of war more powerful than every being in existence put together, but he also has a bunch of beings under him that are on our side. In Hebrews 12, 22, it says, But ye are coming to Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. I believe there's still more angels on our side than there is on the devil's side. And then you have in chapter 7, where the Lord scares the Syrian army with a sound that isn't even real. So it doesn't take much for God to scare man to death in second kings 7 6 through 8 it says for the lord had made the host of the syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses even the noise of a great host and they said one to another lo the king of israel hath hired against us the kings of the hittites and the kings of the egyptians to come upon us wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses even the camp as it was and fled for their life and when these lepers came to the othermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and come again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. So the lepers were able to go and get all that stuff from those guys just because the Lord made them hear a noise that wasn't even real. So imagine at the second coming, when the Lord is literally coming, coming back at the enemy and wailing and howling with eyes like a flame of fire and with a sharp two-edged sword. Imagine how people are going to be running scared from that with ten thousands of his saints behind him. Can you imagine the, the noise? And in chapter 9, you see where Jezebel finally meets her well-deserved end, the most wicked woman in the Bible, is Jezebel. She tries to seduce Jehu in chapter 9. It says in 2 Kings 9, 30 through 32, And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace, who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trolled her underfoot. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, Go, see now this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore, they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. And that's where you get the saying, For the dogs. And the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field and the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. So you couldn't even tell who she was. But she tried to seduce Jehu. 
she painted her face. And that's what many women do today. They try to seduce. She's a seducer. She reminds you of that, the, the whore in Revelation chapter 17. But Jezebel has been in hell ever since. And Jehu was very zealous for God, killing the enemies of God, but he yet still wasn't where he needed to be with God himself. In 2 Kings 10, 28 through 31, it says, Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel, howbeit for the, from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them, to wit the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. So he didn't learn from the mistakes of those that went before him. And if you don't learn from the mistakes of those before you, then you'll end up repeating them, just like Jehu repeated the sins of Jeroboam. And in chapter 11, Ahab's sister, Athaliah, kills all the seed royal and reigns six years. But there was one that she thought she thought she had all of them killed. She thought she killed all of that seed. But was, there was one that was hid. Joash was hid. In 2 Kings 11, 1 through 3, it says, And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. But Je Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain. And they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. And he was with her hid in the house of the Lord six years, and Athaliah did reign over the land. So just like Joash is hid until he gets the throne, Jesus Christ is hid right now and hid until he gets his throne. So you see the picture there. Second Kings eleven twenty through twenty one says, and all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was in quiet, and they slew Athaliah and the sword beside the king's house, with the sword beside the king's house. Seven years old was Jehoash when he began to reign. So Joash or Jehoash here is only seven years old when he begins to reign, and he was hid. Until he got the throne. Just like right now Jesus Christ is hid. And he's about to get the throne. When Athaliah executed. When Athaliah was executed. Jehoash gets the throne. Then in chapter 12 we see. Jehoash reigns 40 years. In 2 Kings 12 too, it says. Jehoash did that which was right. In the sight of the Lord all his days. Wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Notice he did right in the sight of the Lord. When Jehoiada instructed him relating this to today your preacher if he is worth anything will instruct you in righteousness using the bible because all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness so staying under good biblical preaching on a regular basis will help you stay right in the eyes of the lord and that's why jehoash stayed right when Jehoiada the priest was instructing him. Now 2 Kings 13, 14 says, Now Elijah was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. And Joash the king of Israel came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. But on his deathbed, Elijah lets Joash know that he will smite the Syrians. So Elijah, even though he's going out, he's he's gonna die here he's still prophesying in second kings 14 1 through 3 it says in the second year of joash son of jehoash jehoi is jehoahaz king of israel reigned amaziah the son of joash king of judah he was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign and reigned 20 and 9 years in jerusalem and his mother's name was jehoadan of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David his father. He did according to all things as Joash his father did. Notice that these kings are always compared to how they measure up to David, who is the standard. 
And David is a type of Jesus Christ. When it comes to you spending eternity with God, you have to measure up to the standard. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is a problem, and that is no man on earth has ever measured up to such a standard without God giving them freely the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So God promises to give every man the righteousness of Jesus Christ when they believe on Jesus Christ as their crucified, buried, and risen Savior. Then, when it comes to eternity and how God sees you, you can measure up to that standard. But without the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you'll you never make it. Now, 2 Kings 15, 1-4. In the twenty and seventh year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. Sixteen years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned two and fifty years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jacob. Jecoliah of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burned incense still on the high places. Maybe that is like you, you're doing right in the sight of the Lord, like Azariah, but the high places were not removed. You're reading your Bible, you're praying, you're trying to stay in fellowship, but... There is something in your high places that is keeping you from going on further for God. Remove the high places. Quit burning incense to the false god in your life. You have that TV show you love. It's clean for the most part, but then there is that one little reoccurring thing on it that is sinful. And every time you watch it, you have to push God aside for an hour until the show's over. That's your high place. Remove the high place and go on to the next level for God. And then in 2 Kings 16, 1 through 3, in the seventeenth year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father. Notice it's making the standard to be David again. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen, which the Lord cast out, from before the children of Israel. So notice this guy Ahaz did according to the abominations of the heathen. So he followed the worldly fads. If J. Lo and Shakira put on, got on stage and performed a satanic, pedophilic, Baphomet-loving performance, he would record it with his iPhone and watch it over and over. If Eminem put on a new video that got 10 million views in one day, he would be all over it. If Kyrie Irving came out with a shoe with the all-seeing eye on it, he would go out and charge it on his credit card. He followed the ways of the world. He wanted to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He followed the abominations of the heathen. In chapter 17, you see the captivity of the northern tribes taken by Assyria. And that's a big event in the Bible. In 2 Kings 17, 5 through 8, it says, Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hala and in, in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel, and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. So Israel was so ungodly, and for that reason the Lord lets them go into captivity. They were idol worshippers and were completely immoral. Similar to America today with all the violence, the sexual sins, the abortion, which is much, nothing more than child sacrifice. And people are sacrificing their children to the God of self. <clears throat> they love their self too much to have sacrificial love for a child, so they just sacrifice their child to the God of self. They are baby killers, false God worshipers. It's complete murder. They are murderers. They're, the abortion doctors are nothing but serial killers. Ted Bundy, Gary Ridgway, Joseph James D'Angelo, Ed Gein, and Jeffrey Dahmer rode into one, couldn't kill as many as these abortion doctors. They are sick, twisted, satanic individuals. I wouldn't trust them enough to leave them alone with my dog if I had one.
If a man is so sick in his mind that he will suck the brains out of a baby when the baby is alive, then no doubt about it, he is full of the devil. He's full of hell. He's got some serious problems. And Israel was like this. You have the mention of child sacrifice in verse 17 of chapter 17. And it says, And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So you see, this child sacrifice stuff reminds you of abortion, what people are doing today. And in chapter 18, you have King Hezekiah who sits under the preaching of the prophet Isaiah. And that is some good preaching. Notice that most of the prophets you see in the Bible are living during the times of the kings. That will make you see the Bible differently when you figure that out. And Hezekiah is a breath of fresh air. He is a good king, and he removed some things. In 2 Kings 18, 3 through 5, it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places, and broke the images, and cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nehashton. And he trusted the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. So notice he removed the high places. Maybe there are some things you need to remove from your hard drive, from your iPhone, from your playlist that you listen to at work. He break the images. If you're using social media and looking at pornographic images on there, maybe you should break the habit. Notice he cut down the groves. That's where men should would worship idols in the shadows of the trees. Maybe you should quit lurking in the shadows and committing secret sins in the dark because you think God can't see you there because he does see you there. And notice he cut in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses made back in Numbers. What was a good thing ended up being an idol to the people. You can make an idol out of a good thing. But you need to fix these things. In chapter 20, Hezekiah is sick unto death. But he prays unto the Lord, and the Lord instantly answers the prayer, gives him 15 more years, and that's a good amount of years. That's half my life. I mean, 15 more years, that's pretty good. In Second Kings 20, 1 through 5, it says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos came to him, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall, and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass, before Isaiah was gone into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of thy David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day. Thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for mine own sake and for David's sake, for my servant David's sake. So the power of prayer helped Hezekiah be delivered out of the king of Assyria and also gave him fifteen years. And next you have possibly the worst king of all, and that is King Manasseh. And his story is a fascinating story because it's Hezekiah's son which wouldn't have been born had Hezekiah not got those extra 15 years. <coughs> but it says in 2 Kings 21, 1, Manasseh was 12 years old and he began to reign and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephzibah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he reared up altars for Baal, and made a grove, and did, as did Ahab king of Israel, and washed up all the host of heaven, and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son, and, and he made his son pass through the fire, and observed times, and used enchantments, and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. 
And he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house, of which the Lord said to David, And to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all tribes of Israel, I put my name forever. Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I gave their fathers, only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them, and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they hearkened not, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. So a, a wicked king led to wicked people. He made every faith acceptable, pretty much except the worship of the God of Israel. He put idols in the place of the one true God. And then in chapter 22, you have one of the greatest kings, and that is Josiah. 2 Kings 22.1, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned, fifth, or he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah. Jedida, I'm saying that completely wrong, probably. The daughter of Adiah of Bosketh. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the ways of David his father, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. During this time... You have someone find the book of the law of the Lord. And he found the words of God. And noticed King Josiah's reaction when Hilkiah finds the words of the Lord. In 2 Kings 22, 11 through 13, it says, And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikim the son of Shaphan, and Akbar the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the scribe, and As Asahiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go ye, inquired of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. So the word of God made Josiah realize he needed to change some things in his life. So he came in and cleaned house, as you see in chapter 23, after reading the words of God, look what Josiah does. It says in 2 Kings 23, 4, And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order, and the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal, and for the grove, and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kedron, and carried the ashes of them into Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah, and in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. And he brought, down, brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem to the book, brook Kedron, and burnt, burned it at the brook Kedron, and stamped it small to powder, and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. And he brake down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the groves. So he did it come in on the throne celebrating LGBT. He knew the sodomites were wicked. He didn't say his views on sodomy were evolving like T.D. Jakes. He put an end to it because it ruins a nation, makes the men sissies and the women butches, a total role reversal contrary to how God wanted it. So he break down the the houses of the sodomites that were by the house of the lord where the women wove hangings for the grove probably making some rainbow stuff because they like to steal god's symbols but they are full of the devil and if man if a man is so sick that he would commit sodomy what would he do a few years from now sin is a progression sin gets worse and if a man is that sick and nasty i wouldn't trust my dog with him if i had one i wouldn't trust leaving my hamster with him if i had one but in 2 Kings 23, 29 through 30, it says, and In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. And King Josiah went against him, and he slew him at Megiddo. Megiddo. When he had seen him, and his servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo, and brought him to Jerusalem, and buried him in his own sepulcher. And the people of the land took Jehoah, Ahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in his father's stead. So Josiah ends up dying in battle. This should remind us to fight until the very end. As Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So now you're going to see Judah go into captivity. In 2 Kings 24, 8 through 11, 
Since Jehoiakim was 18 years old and he began to reign, he reigned in Jerusalem three months, and his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. At that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. Now Zedekiah ends up being made king by Nebuchadnezzar. In Second Kings 24, 15 through 18, it says, And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon, and the king's mother, and the king's wives, and his officers, and the mighty of the land. Those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon, and all the men of might, even seven thousand, and craftsmen, and smiths, a thousand, all that were strong and apt for war. Even them the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. And the king of Babylon made Mathaniah his father's brother king in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. And Zedekiah was twenty and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. However, Zedekiah rebels and ends up with a tragic end. As you know in Second Kings twenty five seven, and they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him with fetters of brass, and carried him to Babylon. So before they took his eyes out, they slew his sons. What a horrible image <coughs> to have for the last thing that you would see. That would be the thing most recent in his memory that would play over and over again in his head was seeing his two sons slew, and it's his fault. But what a book. Life is tough. I'm ready for the rapture. People are crazy. People are killers. This book reminds me that people are bloody, nasty, filthy killers. And I'm too little for this world. But I have someone big living in me that's going to get me out. Your life is so fragile. It wouldn't take much to knock you off as you saw all the death in this book. You're too small to handle the evil men in this world. You're too small to handle the devil. You're too small to handle God. The best thing you can do is humble yourself before God. Tell him you're weak and stupid. And you can't make it without him. And then God will take care of you. He'll keep you safe from the world and the devil until it's your time to go, or until the rapture. But this has been Second Kings Overview.